Good afternoon. Welcome to first afternoon session on Wednesday. Uh, Oscillation in strong gravity. Chairman is Professor Vladimir Karas. Thank you. <clears throat> so good afternoon also. Uh, it's a great pleasure to chair this session. You will have three talks and the first one is by uh, Jiří Horák uh, on oscillation modes of thick accretion disks using finite elements calculations. So Jirka, please, if you can share the screen. Yes. Good afternoon, Elgo. I will try to share. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, you can okay. see. Okay, so uh, this rec time I actually prepared two talks. I was planning only one talk, but then I was asked by uh, our colleague Gabo Terek to uh, talk about this subject. So actually I have one voluntary talk and one kind of required talk. <laughs> so this one is the one which is required. And uh, it's, it is about oscillation mode of thick accretion disk. And uh, usually this subject is kind of studied quite extensively, uh, mostly in Opava, uh, using analytic methods. So the idea was to check whether this analytic method works and how much they work, uh, to what kind of extent, uh, using some simple numerical calculation. So this is the subject of this talk. Here is the outline. So. I will talk first about some stationary configurations, like uh, this is well-known old stuff, so it will be quite fast. Then I will talk about uh, perturbation of this configuration, uh, and I will derive like a relativistic Pavlovian Pringle equation uh, for arbitrary momentum distribution, which is kind of, I think, a little bit new, and uh, I will just uh, sketch how this equation was solved in past analytically. And then I moved to this numerical solution. So I was using a uh, so-called finite element method. And uh, so I will briefly introduce it. I will also formula for, like, uh, make another formulation of this Pavlovian pringle equation in terms of uh, integral. So it's called weak formulation of the problem and a uh, little talk, uh, say only a few words about the implementation. And then I will show some results for axisymmetric modes and non-axisymmetric modes. And if uh, Vladimir Kars uh, will still give me some time, I will even have some discussions and conclusion. <clears throat> so first equilibrium. And equilibrium uh, follows from well-known uh, loss of conservation uh, for perfect fluid. So we start with some uh, test and entry tensor, which looks like this. This U is just for velocity. P is pressure. E is total energy density. So it is rest mass density plus uh, also internal density of the gas. And uh, we assume that uh, the stationary configuration is axisymmetric and it's in pure rotation, so that that is uh, why we assume that uh, the four velocity uh, has this form, <coughs> basically a linear uh, combination of two killing vectors, which describes the symmetry. And uh, this is just uh, the covariant uh, covariant uh, components of the four velocity, and the conservation laws are simply divergent. Of this uh, of this stress energy tensor, which describes the conservation of energy and the momentum, and then we should also um, satisfy satisfy the uh, conservation of the rest mass, which looks like this. So this row is actually rest mass density. And uh, if you take this tensor and uh, impose this. Uh, two conditions for the four velocity and substitute to these equations, you will find out that uh, the rest mass density conservation is uh, satisfied trivially. 
and even the five component of this uh, of this uh, conservation of energy and momentum so you end up with just two equations which uh, you can write in the vector form in the poloidal plane which is this r z plane basically which looks like this here this a is for acceleration and uh, you can derive like uh, from these uh, two forms of the four velocity this expression and then which is quite nice if you assume like special equation of state where everything depends on just one parameter which could be for example uh, particle number density and which uh, which is valid for polytropes or general isentropic flow then uh, you can even integrate this equation to this simple algebraic form where this psi is actually some kind of uh, rotational potential it's, uh, it's some function which uh, you have to calculate uh, when you know how the angular momentum is distributed in, the, in your flow and uh, if you set this angular momentum distribution in the equator in the equatorial plane then somehow it follows how the angular momentum is distributed also in the full volume of the torus because you have to respect uh, this von Seipel, uh, von Seipel condition and you find out that this uh, omega which is angular velocity and angular momentum are <coughs> constant on some surfaces which are called von Seipel, surf von Seipel cylinders and this is what you see here uh, on the pictures below these are these kind of vertical uh, little bit bent lines so these are von Seipel cylinders and uh, when you when you now already uh, where the angular velocity is constant and angular momentum is constant you can easily kind of use this uh, simple uh, simple condition to calculate uh, how enthalpy is distributed and uh, instead of enthalpy you can use this so-called lane and then function uh, which has this very simple algebraic form and this uh, f function is basically just kind of uh, the useful tool to describe the structure of uh, any polytropic body so we are assumed that this f is just in the interval of zero to one where one is corresponding to the uh, to the point of the maximal pressure and uh, zero corresponds to the surface of the of the body so we can do it for arbitrary momentum distribution so here it's kind of prominent case when where the angular momentum is constant everywhere in the in the torus and this is kind of very easy to, to calculate but you can also think about something more kind of complicated so here there is uh, there is kind of special little bit uh, funny angular momentum distribution which is constant and then suddenly it's Keplerian and then it's constant again and uh, using this uh, simple formalism you can calculate how this torus would look like you are free to choose angular momentum distribution because you are using per perfect fluid so you don't have kind of uh, redistribution of the angular momentum so what you set at the beginning is uh, satisfied all the time how big the torus can be so this picture is actually valid only for constant angular momentum and then you will see that uh, actually there are two limiting cases uh, for the maximal size of the torus so first of all the torus can be limited by the appearance of the cusp in its inner edge this is shown here all these configurations are kind of maximal uh, where the cusp is in, a, in the inner edge and the cusp corresponds to the point where this angular momentum distribution of the torus uh, 
much the local Keplerian angular momentum. And uh, so this is the first limitation. And then the second limitation is that the torus cannot be bigger than infinite torus. So uh, if you if you draw the uh, equipotential surfaces, you will find out that suddenly it may happen that some of these surfaces uh, surface goes like up to infinity. So obviously it cannot be bigger. And uh, this is limited. Uh, this is this limitation. So for large tori, uh, this is I think for Schwarzschild space time. So for tori which are greater than uh, I think it's a little bit more than 10, 10.2 10 or something. So tori which are kind of larger uh, are mostly terminated or limited by this condition of infinite torus. But if your uh, center of the torus is closer, then you face more to this limit of the of the cusp at the inner edge. So it looks like this. And obviously, for some special value, you can have the biggest torus which is possible, which is happening exactly this here, where you have cusp torus, which goes to infinity. It's uh, for the special position of the torus center. And here I show how this torus looks like. So uh, this is just finite picture, right? But if I will make it uh, larger, then you will see that this torus is really extremely large. It's, uh, it's infinite. And what is quite funny uh, is that if you if you draw it, you will see that this cusp is actually dividing the uh, this. Uh, segment between the center of the black hole and the torus center exactly in the golden ratio. So these torus are, tor tori are even nice. So here I will talk briefly about perturbations. And uh, perturbations are calculated very simply. You are just kind of uh, perturb these two uh, conservation laws. And uh, you assume that perturbation is linear, so uh, you keep only first order terms in this perturbation. And uh, if you do it, then you have quite complicated equation, which may be even a little bit uh, make simple uh, by introducing some special, special, uh, special variables. So, for example, this variable has quite a uh, easy geometrical meaning. It's a, it's an angular velocity or angular frequency of the perturbation measured by the observer, which is corrotating at given radius with the fluid. And uh, this M is uh, just a simplification. It doesn't have any nice meaning. And this eta is just kind of fractional perturbation of the enthalpy. So if you do it and uh, write all these equations like in the component, so this is this poloidal component uh, where delta u is poloidal velocity perturbation, and this is phi component of uh, this uh, Euler equation, and then you have perturbation of the uh, continuity equation, which looks like this. And of course, we would like to solve it somehow. Mm -hmm. And it, ideally, we would like to end up with a single equation for a single variable. And uh, this can be ba done by some algebraic tricks. So I introduced these strange uh, three four vectors. Uh, no, these are not four vectors. These are just two vectors in this poloidal plane. And uh, by introducing it, you can kind of, uh, and introducing the special variable, which looks like this, uh, then you can actually, by some manipulation, end up with a single equation, which looks like this. So this is the single equation for this perturbation variable w, which is somehow proportional to enthalpy. And uh, you see that there is this p, which is uh, some kind of projector, 
uh, to these two vectors and so on. So it can be quite complicated, but uh, at the end we end up with single equation. So it's a dual. And um, of course, if uh, you assume some simplification or you have like some concrete uh, angular momentum distribution, you can uh, this equation quite simplified. So for example, for a constant angular momentum, we end up with this quite simple equation for this. So it's second order partial differential equation is in space. And basically it represents eigenvalue problem. And the uh, eigenvalue is this omega, the real oscillation angular frequency. And uh, eigenfunction is uh, this W, which describes how the perturbation looks in the space. Somehow, if you kind of inspect this equation in more details, you will find out that it's actually something what is called quadratic eigenvalue problem. People are kind of familiar with uh, linear eigenvalue problem when you have some operator, or some matrix acting on a vector, and here you would have uh, just eigen eigenvalue times the same vector is equal to zero. So this is the linear, but here it is nonlinear because uh, this omega are actually a function of the space. So you have to really expand everything and then you end up with quadratic eigenvalue problem where there is omega and omega squared, which is quite unpleasant and there are not too many theorems how to solve this problem. But fortunately, in the case where your, when your tor torus is very small, you will find out, that, find out that this problem is actually reduced to linear problem for quadratic or for the square of this oscillation frequency. And the trick is that if you, your torus is very small, which is characterized by this beta, this, uh, the size of the torus. So if it is very small, then this omega, which was here, omega one and omega here, this omega. So this omega is not changing too much across the torus. And therefore you can kind of uh, look at that as, uh, as a constant. So then you end up really with the linear eigenvalue problem and it's easy to solve or relatively easy to solve. Uh, and uh, the nice thing about the this eigenvalue problem is that this operator L is Hermitian, which means that uh, all eigenfunctions which you find by solving this problem uh, makes complete orthogonal set. And therefore you can use this eigenfunction as a basis of uh, some Hilbert space, which describes all perturbation of the torus. And with this, you can even go further and try to calculate most of larger torus. So for example, here, uh, I am uh, expanding like the uh, eigen function and eigen value of the torus, which has finite beta, which is a little bit larger uh, in some perturbation series. But thanks to this uh, completeness of this, uh, zero order um, eigenfunction, I can expand all these perturbations, which would be difficult to solve as a li in, in this basis. So at the end, I end up with just algebraic equation in all steps uh, for this C. And uh, this way, actually, you can solve uh, for arbitrary mod in R on in not so large torus. You, of course, you depend very much on, uh, on the question, how much this series will converge, right? What is the, what is the radius of the convergence of this, uh, of this uh, power series, which is, not our, uh, which is not obvious from the beginning. And that was also the reason why we try to uh, solve it numerically to see actually the range of applicability or range of validity of this. 
and uh, but analytically it was done uh, it was the first calculation was made by Omer Bless very long time ago and uh, it was done for one specific mode which is called core taping mode then uh, quite recently Eva Stamkova who starts maybe with us even and Omer uh, kind of used the same for already kind of uh, torus which is not in Newtonian potential so somehow it should mimic the effect of GR and uh, then Eva and Odele Straub uh, used the same calculation for really relativistic storing curve space time. Five minutes. No, five minutes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Five? Five. Ah, okay. So there are all kinds of modes. Here you can see uh, like the simplest ones. And uh, here it looks, uh, here you can see how it looks like when the torus is a little bit bigger. So you see from this radial mode that actually would have kind of constant displacement over the torus. Here you see that the displacement are not constant. So this is the effect of these higher order terms in this beta expansion. And now how we solve it. So uh, we just kind of by some manipulations made from this quadratic uh, eigenvalue problem, linear eigenvalue problem, like, but for two component vectors. And then uh, one has to multiply it by some test function, uh, uh, this equation. And at the end, you find out that you have to solve actually single eigenvalue problem for uh, like large matrices. And these uh, matrices are actually uh, basically combining all uh, all values in uh, all uh, all vertices of some triangulation which you impose on this uh, on this torus. So here you have you see just kind of one half of the torus because it is symmetric, so we don't need to use the other half. And of course, it depends how much uh, how much of these elements you. you you put in the torus, and uh, with increasing number of uh, these elements, so you are kind of your precision is better and better. So this, you see relative error, and it really goes down like four to minus n. And how looks like the result? So there are kind of simple modes, radial mode and vertical epicyclic mode. And uh, by this procedure, you see that uh, actually this is. Uh, this is how it looks for particle or very thin torus. And if, if uh, you increase the volume of the torus, uh, you are basically lowering the frequency. So, so as you go from up to down, uh, the beta, this uh, thickness parameter increases. Uh, for high, uh, very thick torus, you have very small frequencies. This is the same for the higher order mode. And here is the comparison with the analytic results. So you see that some modes are actually very well described already with this analytic calculation up to the second order, but uh, the other ones are kind of uh, rather poor. Here is the same again, but for different position. Uh, here uh, you, is again the same. This uh, this dashed line is analytic result, and this full line is the result of our numerical calculation. And uh, this was for uh, axisymmetric modes. And then we tried another calculation with non-axisymmetric modes. And uh, we discovered quite interesting behavior. So we took here just kind of radial epicyclic modes, which uh, m equal plus 1 and rad uh, no, vice versa, m equal minus 1 and m equal plus 1. And uh, as you increase the volume of the torus, you see that these two modes somehow merge together and uh, create one unstable mode. And then they kind of again uh, divide. And uh, here I was following just one of the modes which kind of arise from there. And the question is what is happening there? OK, there is another example. So here even this, uh, so. 
So uh, these two modes, which merge, then it's unstable. Then it divides again, and this other mode, which kind of uh, is emerging, immediately meets the uh, uh, the plus mode, and uh, again merge and make another unstable mode, and so on. So what is happening here is actually that uh, one mode. Uh, so this is the uh, this m equal minus one mode. This is the m equal plus mode. And uh, as they are increasing the volume, you will see that uh, uh, two of them actually are oscillating in different parts of the volume. And there is one important radius in the, in the volume of the torus, and that is so-called corrotation resonance. And uh, if uh, your oscillations are mostly behind this corrotation point, then uh, your oscillation increase the energy of the system. On the other hand, if uh, it is main, mostly inside the corrotation, they are decreasing energy of the system. So when these two modes, uh, as uh, you increase the volume, then uh, the, this mode has more and more negative energy, and this mode has more and more positive energy. And when they merge, uh, they even, no, they start with negative energy, this one starts with positive energy, but uh, as uh, it increases, uh, this is less negative and this is less positive. And at the end, when, uh, when, you, when they merge, they create one mode which has zero energy. So therefore, uh, even the instability doesn't break the energy conservation because uh, this mode has zero energy. And, uh, the oscillating torus have the same energy as if there are no oscillations. And uh, this is another example how it works. So here you have this radial mode, which uh, is oscillating mostly in the inside the corrotation. So it has negative energy. This one has positive energy. But as uh, you increase the volume, then, uh, then the portion of this uh, positive energy here is less and less. So the, they are. Okay, okay, and, and my conclusions. <laughs> my conclusions are uh, basically just very simple and free. Uh, analytic results works quite well. It's amazing, even for quite serious beta. So for example, every mod works perfectly for 0.2 beta. And some of them even work uh, my too much higher beta, for example, to beta 0.5. Uh, however, analytic uh, calculation could not kind of review this instability, which I was talking uh, just one minute ago. And uh, what is quite surprising for me, actually, that even if you have well-defined mod for higher beta, they can make all kind of mixtures and then uh, you basically end up with completely different mode. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yeji. So we have uh, some time for quick question. Anyone is interested to ask? Uh, we have Sorry. Yeah. No, no. Do we have something? If you go even thinner with your torus, maybe you mentioned, but I maybe maybe I didn't know. So what is uh, happening? Mm, if you go but, thinner, mm -hmm. if I go thin, no, basically for thin torus, I uh, I know the analytic calculate. Uh, I know the analytic <coughs> results. So I know all these eigenfunctions and eigen. Uh, uh, again, frequency of the more, and already I tried like uh, beta 0 0.01, which which is like the radial extent is uh, like uh, 0.1 m, and already for these uh, these tori, I, I I've got perfect agreement with the analytic results. So I don't think that if I will go even for smaller and smaller, it will change. Uh -huh. like this, 
okay. this case mm -hmm. is covered, yeah. Okay, thanks. And if I may ask, is there anything special about this critical uh, torus, which is uh, just touching? <laughs> the, uh, I, I, I don't I don't think there is anything special. I think this torus was once used for uh, like mm, modeling of suppression of papillosum pringle instability um, uh, by the accretion. So mm -hmm. for this, you need like infinite torus, which is infinite supply of matter, and you need also the cusp, right? But otherwise, uh, except for this golden ratio, I don't think there is anything <laughs> special. Mm -hmm. I mean, these oscillations do not behave in some particular. All, yeah, for if you go to infinity with volume, then all frequencies of oscillation go to zero, basically. Mm -hmm. so it's infinitely heavy thing. Also. <laughs> okay, thank you, Iri, for mm -hmm. interesting talk.